Okay, everyone, sorry for missing class the other day. Uh, hopefully um, you enjoyed the break from my lectures and uh, had a nice lecture from Mike. We're going to continue on um, with the discussion of genome annotation. And today what we're really going to get into is the formats that we use to, to represent gene annotations. And in exploring those, those file formats and some of the idiosyncrasies therein, um, we're also going to discuss this new uh, Unix tool, which you probably either Googled about or know something about by this point. But we're get, going to get into the gory details of using awk. Um, it's an incredibly powerful programming language, actually. It's a command line tool, but you can actually write mini programs with awk, and it's a super nice way of filtering and subsetting data uh, on the command line for basically exploratory data analysis. Um, so um, just to revisit some topics that were talked about last time, um, what I want to do is just walk through how you use the UCSC table browser just quickly. Um, if you go to UCSC uh, Genome Browser and you go to the Tools uh, um, menu and go to Table Browser, you get this sort of 1990s looking interface um, of, of exploring their, their database of, of tracks. So what Mike probably told you last time is that behind the scenes, um, you know, the UCSC Genome Browser and Ensemble, they're great because they show for every lots of different genomes, human, mouse, lots of different model organisms. You can actually access all the annotations that are, well, most of the annotations that are available for those, for those critters. Um, but behind the scenes, the way it's doing that, when you jump to a particular locus in the genome, it's querying a database that it maintains behind the scenes that, that basically have all these annotations. What's really cool about the table browser, and it's called table browser because these data are stored in database tables, which you could think of as just spreadsheets. Um, so if you jump to chromosome 17 to the P53 locus and want to show CPG islands and genes, it's literally querying different database tables to get, to get that information to display to you on the fly. So you can act the, what the table browser allows is to actually access that raw data behind the scenes. So in this case, I'm, I'm looking at the human genome, Build 37. Uh, this slide was made a few years ago when everyone still used Build 37. Um, the, these tables are grouped into different types. So this is genes and gene predictions. There's lots of different gene annotations. There's RefSeq, there's Ensemble, there's GenCode, there's all sorts of things like this. I just chose RefSeq because that's sort of the most conservative, high confidence set of gene annotations and transcript annotations. Um, that ultimately leads to a table. So this table ref gene is literally a database table hosted in this beautiful server room in Santa Cruz, California that we can query and get data from, right? Um, and then what you end up asking is, well, how do I want that data to be formatted when I retrieve it from the database? So you could get sort of the raw database results or what UCSC will do is convert it to a format like this one called BED which stands for browser, browser Extensible Data, which is probably the worst name for some sort of genome annotation because it's not really intuitive as to what that means. Um, BED was actually the browser part of this, uh, the B stands for browser, and that, that really comes from the fact that this format was defined at the same time that the UCSC genome browser was built. So it's sort of their format for the browser, hence Browser Extensible Data. Okay, and then when you click get output, it'll either puke that the contents of that table in bed format to the screen to your browser, or you can give it a file name and you can actually save it to a file. Okay, so in this case, if I call it refseq.bed, hit get output, I can ask it to give me the whole gene. So the interval from the transcription start set, well, actually from the five prime UTR to the to the end of the three prime UTR. Or I can ask it to just give me the exons, or just the introns, or just the five prime UTRs. So you can, it's really nice actually. You can just use a simple interface to get the subsets of genes that you might be interested in. And then once you make that decision, you can hit click bed, and then it'll bring up a uh, dialog. If you're using Chrome, it'll prompt you to ask 
where you want to save it. If you're using Safari, it'll probably just go to your downloads directory. And if you're using Firefox, I have no idea. Um, but then when you get, when you look at that file, um, then this is going to be the focus of today's lecture. There's some columns that make a lot of sense, like the chromosome, the start coordinate, the end coordinate. And then there's a bunch of other information in here that may make less sense. So we're going to talk about what, what's going on there today. Um, so let's, let's actually go through this process together and save this refseek.bed file to our laptop. Okay, so hopefully everyone has an internet connection. Let's go back. So you can follow along in the slides. It's like, I mean, you can just fill in, point and click. But I'll do it on my computer. So if I go to the UCSC genome browser, I can go to tools, table browser. Okay, I'm going to move fairly quickly because this information is on your, on your slides. Um, I'm going to switch it back to build 37 of the human genome. We're going to go back in time. I'm going to switch the group, not, uh, I'm going to switch it from regulation. This is how you get CPG islands and enhancers and stuff like that. I'm going to switch it to genes and gene predictions. Okay. Then the track, I'm going to switch from, look at this. There's so many different gene annotations, gene predictions. It's a bit overwhelming. So I just go with the, um, the boring bit, which would be NCBI RefSeq. And, no, oh, that's slight, they've changed it. Okay, so from the time that I made this slide three years ago, they've named it not RefSeq, they've called it NCBI RefSeq. Okay. Um, so then I'm just gonna switch it to bed, and I'm gonna change the output format to bed format, and then call it RefSeq dot bed. How uh, visible is the screen in the back? Can you guys read anything? Pretty bad? Okay. Yeah. So mine, I think, mine is a little different from yours. For table options, I have like NCBI rest and period and NCBI rest and other. And then I have like NCBI rest and CSL. And then I have the CSL. You don't have this top one? Uh, yes, I do. So, okay, it is Okay, no, 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 no problem. Um, and so then we hit good output. Um, and I want the whole gene. I'm going to click get bed. Uh, I'm going to put this on my desktop, call it refseek.bed, hit save. And I've got a file on my laptop. Okay. But here's the problem. You shouldn't be doing this type of analysis usually on your laptop. You should be doing it on CHPC or... Or something like that. So the question is now how the heck do you get the file that you just downloaded from UCSC onto something like Malibu because you can't, at least to my knowledge, you can't launch the UCSC, UCSC genome browser from Malibu. Okay, um, you've probably faced this problem before and probably have a solution but I just want to review formally how you do this. Um, the command that you use to do this is SCP for secure copy. So it's, just, it's a super, it's a fancy version of CP, which we've already talked about, copy a file from one directory to another or rename it. Um, this is to copy a file from one computer to another computer. So, so the, the structure is we want to securely copy SCP, this file name. This assumes that we've gone to the right directory on our, on our laptop. And I'm just not referring to a directory here. This just means we're in the directory where this refseek.bed file is. And this is the, the source file. And then this is the destination. Okay. But the destination um, is really telling SCP how you want to connect to the computer. So your user ID. So the user ID on my laptop is Aaron Quinlan, not my actual unit. So I have to specify what my unit is on Malibu. So I want to move it to my unit at malibu.genetics.utah.edu. And then this last little bit is saying, where do I want to put that file on this computer? So this colon means everything after the colon is a path to the location at which I want this new file placed, right? So tilde is my home directory slash. 
So just put it in my home directory, right? Does everyone follow that? When you hit enter, just one second, when you hit enter, it's gonna prompt you for a password. And if you type in the right password, it'll copy the file, yeah. So you're doing it before you SSH the security Correct, yes. Yep, so we will copy the file using, this SCP uses the same security um, protocols that SSH does. So S in SSH is secure shell, this is secure copy, okay? But it's basically using the same kind of protocols. All right, so I am, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, show you how to do this command on the command line. And this, this, this uh, approach works the other way too. I could, com I could copy from Malibu to my local computer, All right? So if I have a file that is, I spent three hours processing and, and getting just right on Malibu, and now I want to present that in lab meeting or something, or I want to make just like a basic spreadsheet or do some sort of analysis in R locally on my computer, often you want to yank the file down to your laptop, and this is how you do it. Okay, so this, this description is really geared towards um, Linux and Apple computers. If you have a PC, there's another way to do this. You can, PuTTY has a way to just copy files back and forth. It's essentially using secure copy behind the scenes. There's probably another, what's another, is there some other program that people use on Windows that I don't know about now? <coughs> Sigwin, it can do the same thing? Okay, is Sigwin, Sigwin I would bet wants you to use secure copy, um, but someone else told me the name of some kind of funny named, that's the one. Yeah, Cyberduck can do the transfer. Um, okay, right, so I'm gonna back out here. I'm just gonna copy this command. Um, oh, I'm on Malibu, so let me get onto my actual computer. Should be something called ref seek. All right, so I'm gonna copy that. I'm just gonna paste in this command and it prompts me for a password. I have no idea what my password is. So I've gotta get it here. Ooh, this is gonna be recorded. Yeah. Now, yeah, let's bite the bullet. <laughs> Shoot. Now my password manager is not behaving, so I can't even get my password. This is super embarrassing. Um, yeah, well, it's not going to work for me. Um, is it working for any of you? Have you been able to, has anyone been able to copy with SCP? Is anyone struggling? Okay. Um, to be frank, nor am I. Um, but there is a way. Why don't you use your friend Google and ask about secure? It might it might actually be that Putty has a separate tool like Putty that you have to download to do secure copy. I haven't done that in a long time. Is anyone else facing that problem? How many Windows users do we have? I didn't haven't really paid attention to this. If you're using Putty, I think um, Google Putty SCP, and then it'll probably point you to something that is, it's like another .exe file that you can download that is for secure copy. Okay, all right. Um, I'm very confident that all of you can figure that out. This is a pretty common task. Putty can do it. Um, and if you're using Mac, you probably had some success with secure, secure copy. All right. Um, and put, the PuTTY version will all also allow you to yank files down from Malibu or CHPC to your local laptop. All right, so now what we're going to talk about um, is these file formats and how they really are, are using the reference genome as a coordinate system. So Let's think about the first part of chromosome three. Let's imagine that the sequence starts like this. This is actually what's in the FASTA file. Every one of these nucleotides represents a position on that chromosome, right? So um, 
here's some what, what's drawn on the UCSC genome browser is a line like this for some feature that's that exists from I don't know the first through the eighth nucleotide on chromosome three what's really nice about this convention just referring to features in the genome by numbers is that it's much more efficient we don't actually have to describe the nucleotide sequence of that feature um, so it's much more compact. More importantly, um, the nucleotide sequence itself is actually not enough information because this nucleotide sequence, CAG, TCA, TCGAC, might exist 5,000 times in the genome. So if I just said, this is my feature, you'd almost, you basically have to do alignment to the reference genome to figure out where that might go. So just like the line coordinate systems that we learned in fourth grade, that's what my son's working on right now, we get, we get to describe things in the genome with a start coordinate and an end coordinate, and then the last piece of information that you need is, is the chromosome on which that exists. Um, so the, beaut the other thing about this is we can also give um, metadata or descriptions about these annotations. So, this interval from position one to position eight on chromosome three might be the discovery that gets you the Nobel Prize, or it might be an exon description, or it might be, hey, this is something my lab is really interested in. This is a weird region. Our data is not behaving right here. It can be anything. It's totally free form. The thing that has to be consistent, however, is that the coordinate system. Um, okay, so this bed format, browser extensible data format, leverages that concept. The genome, every chromosome being a coordinate system. So the most important three columns in bed format are, not surprisingly, given what I just said, the chromosome, where does this feature live, and what is the start coordinate and what is the end coordinate for that feature. There's nine additional completely optional fields in bed format that give you other pieces of information. Conventionally, the fourth column is a name. So that could be, in the previous slide, Nobel Prize. It could be Exxon 2. It could be P53. It could be Joe, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's totally up to you. Similarly, the fifth column is a score. That could be things like p-values that come out of some prediction algorithm. So this, if you, if you had a bunch of predictions, uh, from chip seek peaks, for instance, maybe I haven't run Max in a long time, but Max is one of the peak callers, and I think it gives a numeric value associated with all the peaks that it thinks it finds from a chip seek peer experiment, and you could use that to rank order those peaks from least confident to most confident, or most confident to least confident, or subset all the chip seek peaks that have um, a score between X and Y. Right. Another very important piece of information in the context of genes especially is the strand. So you can define an exon from position X to position Y on chromosome 10, for instance, but you don't know anything about the reading frame with just the interval. Because remember, the reference genome is it's haploid and it's just one strand of one haploid genome, right? So if, if, the, if the reading frame is in the direction that is opposite to the strand of the reference genome, then you would get a negative sign in the strand. If the reading frame is in the same uh, orientation as the reference genome, you get a plus sign for it's on the, so the reference genome is considered the forward strand. It's totally arbitrary, but um, it's a way of, of annotating um, the reading frames, direction of the reading frame. Okay, I'm going to ignore, for the, for the most part, ignore these 7th through 12th columns. Um, one of them, column 9, is a color. It tells you what color the, um, the track should be displayed in on UCSC. So sometimes I think genes are often in like a dark blue, and conservation is like grayscale. And these are decisions that the UCSC genome browser has made. And they, they encode that information with a what's called a RGB triplet, red, green, blue values. You've probably done this if you've messed around with Illustrator or things like that. You just you choose a value between 0 and 255 for red, green, and blue. And the mixture of those three numbers gives a color. 
These other columns, um, I think the best example is for gene annotations, there's, there's a whole interval which is the complete gene, and then there's parts of that gene annotation which are thick rectangles and then thin lines. The thick rectangles are exons. The slightly less thick rectangles are non-coding exons, so UTRs. And then the thinnest lines are introns. And it's all these columns that describe for this whole interval, where should I, where should I draw, where should it be thick for an exon, where should it become thin for an intron, and at the very end, where should it be kind of thick for a, a UTR. You, we usually never have to worry about that stuff. Um, but this is, this is just how that information is encoded so that when, when UCSC Genome Browser queries its database tables to draw stuff for you on the screen, it's looking at these columns to figure out how to draw it. Okay. Right, so this is where things start to get hairy. Um, one of the biggest problems in genomics is that we've got A, lots of different formats that we have to deal with. I think you can already appreciate that. B, the formats use different coordinate systems, which we're going to talk about in a second, so that sucks. And then the third is that these file formats that use different coordinate systems are abused and tortured and inconsistent. So one of the challenges we face a lot is like, oh, you went to get supplementary table three from some figure that, uh, for some from some paper that um, has annotations that you're interested in, but oh, the the coordinate system they didn't say what version of the genome this came from, because that coordinates are dependent upon the version of the genome, and may, you're not quite sure how the start coordinates and the stop coordinates are represented, um, and that latter point is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, if you, if you go all the way back to fourth or fifth grade, when we talked about line coordinate systems, there was, there was this notion of whether or not when, when you draw a line segment on a line coordinate system, whether the number that you started at is included in that interval or excluded. Um, and that's really the difference between these formats. So if we think about the nucleotide sequence of chromosome 1 starting with TAC, GT, CA. This is the first nucleotide. There's, that's unequivocal. It is the first nucleotide. How we describe that first nucleotide differs based upon how we're representing coordinate systems. So in a, in a one base system, which I think is most intuitive to humans to think about, um, this this first nucleotide is represented by a start coordinate of one. If we wanted to represent just the first nucleotide, an interval with the first nucleotide, it would be chromosome one, start coordinate one, end coordinate one, right? So in a one base system, the numbers actually represent the nucleotides themselves. In a zero base system, the numbers actually represent, um, I guess, the phosphate bonds between the nucleotides on the backbone, right? So if you want to represent the first nucleotide in a zero-based coordinate system, the start is zero, the end is one, okay? And so this gets at, the reasons for this are, are somewhat, somewhat complicated, but um, if you wanted to compute the length of an interval in the one-based system, so if I said that the, this one, first base is represented by start one, end one, to compute the length of that interval, we have to take end minus start, which is zero, plus one. So we always have to do this extra operation, this adding one to compute the length of an interval. In a zero-based system, all we have to do is take end minus start to compute the, end, uh, the length of an interval. So it's more efficient for computers to represent um, intervals in, in this zero-based system. Okay, so, so what, what interval, if we're using bed format, which uses this zero-based um, or zero-based half-open interval system, what interval defines the second and third nucleotides of chromosome 3? What would be our start coordinate for the second through the third nucleotide? One is the start, yep. One to three, yeah. 
So uh, I like to think about it as if it's if you're talking about the second and third, the end, end coordinate is always the the like in this case the third, and then the start coordinate is whatever you would intuitively think of minus one. Okay. Um, there's a lot of I, there's this website called biostars.org that um, you should use if you're if you're working in this area. If you've had a question before, it's probably been question, asked and answered a hundred times on Biostars. Probably the most looked at question and answer dialogue is about this problem. Um, and a guy named O.B. Griffith wrote up a really nice sort of description of all this. Um, so um, if we were to describe different intervals along the, uh, the genome in BED3 format, for instance, you know, this is going from, this one is going from position zero, the first nucleotide, um, through seven, four through 10. And this is really just giving you a sense of these interval described features on the genome. We can add, as I said, names to these annotations. So the first one is, it's got a boring name. It's the first annotation. The second is the second annotation. You can call it one, you can call it two, you can call it um, undo, whatever you want to call it. It's totally up to you. The fifth column is the score. So this can be in any notation. It doesn't even have to be a number. It's, it's said to be a score, but you, could, you can put Roman numerals in there if you want. Um, don't recommend it, but you could. Strand also tells us... Um, the orientation, and this is a, an important point to just talk through for a second. Um, the, the start coordinate is all, regardless of the strand, the start coordinate is always the lower coordinate. The end coordinate is always the higher coordinate. The strand information tells you directionality. So another way of thinking, another way of doing this, which is not the way it works, but just some people think that it would work this way, is if if an interval is on the opposite strand of the reference genome, you would flip the end and the start coordinates. That's, that's not the way it works. So for consistency, the lowest coordinate is always the start, the highest coordinate is always the end, and then you just give that plus minus in the sixth column to say whether you know, it's going this way or that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep, we talked about all this stuff. Let's ignore it for today. Um, but here's what a bed 12, bed 12 includes, the nomenclature means that it's using all 12 of these columns. And as I mentioned, this is like the, you know, the thick, thick rectangles. This is a UTR, these are introns. And then, then there's these arrows. What's, give, what's, what's helping UCSC Genome Browser draw those arrows in the right direction? Right, it's a strand column. And then notice there's different colors. And that comes from this RGB value, which is somewhere in here. Um, I've, I've lost it now. Okay, so that's one format, bed format. It, the, the critical values in bed format are the first three, start, chrom uh, chromosome, start, and end. And then there's this other format called GFF, which stands for gene feature format or general feature format. I've seen two different explanations about what the, in the, on this website it says general feature format, elsewhere it calls it gene for feature format. Same type of information, there's only nine columns in it in the GFF format, um, and you'll notice that three of them are the same core information as bed format. The sequence name, so that's their, that's their uh, name for the chromosome. The first column in GFF and the first column in bed format are the chromosome, essentially. Unfortunately, in GFF, the start and end coordinates are now the fourth and fifth columns rather than the second and third. And even worse, they use a different coordinate system. So GFF is using one base coordinate system instead of zero base. So going back here, it's this top system, coordinate system. So in other words, if you wanted to convert this, so this, this is saying on chromosome 22, some tool called Telegene predicted an enhancer from position, gosh, uh, 10 million to 10 million, 1,000. 
If we wanted to convert this to bed format, how would we change this start and end coordinate? Would we change the end coordinate at all? We would not change the end coordinate. We would just subtract one from the start coordinate. So this gets at why we're actually going to use awk in a second. Um, awk is a tool that will allow us to do that conversion fairly simply. All right. So it's confusing. You spend a couple hours banging your head on the table for a couple months and working with these formats, and it'll just all come naturally, but it's, it's painful. Everyone, everyone goes through this, this pain process. Um, what's kind of nice about GFF, um, I prefer bed format. Um, I think it's a little simpler. But what's nice about GFF is that in, con in contrast to bed format, where an entire transcript annotation is represented at a single line with all those thick start, thick end, thin start, thin end things in big lists. What GFF ends up doing is it's, it's more of a hierarchical uh, system where there's an entry for the entire gene, which starts at 1,000, ends at 9,000. So that'd be like this whole blue line. And then there's sub annotations for that gene. There's descriptions of three different isoforms of this, of this gene, um, three different mRNAs. Each of those mRNAs have different exons and CDS. So what's the difference between CDS and exon? Does anyone know? CDS stands for coding sequence. So all coding, all CDS entries are exons, but not all exons are CDS. Some exons are actually untranslated regions, right? So those would be your UTRs. Um, so what's really ni what's nicer about the GFF format is if we just wanted to find all of the coding sequence for all the genes in the genome, what would we grep for? Yeah, we grep for CDS and maybe enforce that it's uh, protein coding as well. So maybe grep CDS and grep protein underscore coding or something like that. With bed format, you can't do that because all of the coding sequence, UTR, intron sequence is all packed into one line. There's nothing to grep for. So this, this format was perhaps a bit more intelligently designed for working with Unix tools. Um, bed format was really quite clearly designed for com compacting all the information needed to display a gene annotation on a, on a screen. Okay, right, so um, I've kind of touched upon this, you know, the thought is, well, we're all using a coordinate system, but, but so things should be easy. I think I've kind of set up that, no, that's not the case. It actually is hard, and it's hard in many different ways. There's a lot, we've already talked about VCF, SAM, BAM, and today we've talked about BED and GFF. Well, check this out. Two of those, BED and BAM, use this zero-based half-open system. GFF, SAM, and VCF all use a one-based system. Why SAM and BAM, which are basically binary and text versions of the same format, choose to use a different coordinate system? No idea. Um, it's, just, it's just the way it is. Um, so this is, this is kind of one of the laughable but laugh in the way that you might want to cry things about genomics. It's just, it, it, it leads to so much confusion and confusion and inconsistency leads to error. Um, so there's kind of a joke in genomics that if you have an off, you haven't done any real bioinformatics or real genomics work until you've had an off by one error because there's so many different ways to have an off by one error. And, and, and you know, you might think that that's a, just a minor thing, but in some cases it can really matter. Um, right, so there's a lot of different ways where you can, this can cause you to be exhausted. Um, these formats we talked about, we've seen CHR1 as a chromosome label, but formats vary in terms of how they describe chromosome labels. So I've seen capital C, lowercase hr1, I've seen all lowercase, I've seen um, all uppercase. The problem is that tools can't know that those mean the same thing. 
tools are asking, is the chromosome label in this file exactly the same as the chromosome label in this file? It's not going to do any sort of fuzzy guessing to say that they're the same. The only tool that does that is IGB. It tries to figure that out for you. Files can be sorted in different ways. So we have numbers in the second column for bed format. We can, if you use Unix sort as is without any parameters, it will sort that column um, alphabetically. So it'll go instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it'll go 1, 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 because sort of in dictionary order, 10 is going to come after 1. Um, one of the things I see a lot in maintaining this bed tool software that my lab works on is people have a file that they've, uh, a bed file that they put into Excel on a Windows machine, they've saved it to their desktop, and then they transfer that file to a Unix machine. Well, we talked about these hidden characters, the space, uh, the white space characters like tab and new lines. Here's another problem. Windows uses different representation of new lines than Unix, and so when you copy a Windows file to Unix and try to use it on Unix, hilarity ensues. Um, it's all sorts of bad stuff can happen. These file formats are, are um, abused, and, and uh, that, that's just a huge problem in the field, um, and there's lots of other uh, problems that we won't get into. This is mainly just not to really scare you or, or bum you out, but just to have you think about the things that could go wrong with these files, especially when you're using data from other people that hasn't been generated in your lab, when you're trying to integrate data from other publications, or download a file from this website and that website and this website, how to put it all together to do your analysis, um, buyer beware. All right, so what we're gonna work on now, um, now that we've talked about two different file formats, we're actually going to use this, this tool called awk, um, which I, th I think is probably the Unix command that I've used the most in my life. Um, once you get past the very steep learning curve, to you get over that hump, I think you'll take a big deep breath and feel very empowered that you can do lots of cool stuff. So I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to try to get you as close to that inflection point as possible today to explain how it works. Um, Heng Li, um, who's sort of a god in, the, in this field, um, he wrote a really nice little blog post, I guess you would call it, when he was a grad student, about ways to use um, awk and other Unix commands in the context of genomics and biology. I encourage you to check that out. Um, so, if you log into Malibu, Let's just take a sec. Has anyone not logged into Malibu? I just want to see if it, how quickly I can move here. All right, everyone's logged in. Um, there should be a file in your home directory called cpg.bed. Does, does anyone find that to not be true? I think I've lied to it a few times along the course now about files that should be there. Okay, great. So I'm just going to peek at that file. So let's just take a look at it. Good in the back, you can see this. Obviously, you can see it on your own screens, but um, this is a very simple bed file. I know it's a bed file. Um, I trust that it's a bed file. I don't know that it is. I trust it's a bed file because of the way I named it, dot bed, but it, I could have messed that up. But it looks like it, right? The first column is chromosome, second column is start coordinate, third column is end coordinate, and then we've got some description. Um, and I don't really know what the description means other than, hence the name of the file, it's probably predicting a CPG island in, in the human genome. What the score means, don't know. We'd have to go look that up on the UCSC genome browser. But this, if I cat this file, there's, there's lots and lots of intervals um, from lots of different chromosomes, some of these weird alternate chromosomes. Uh, chromosome 19, 20, etc. So there's tons of data in here. If I wanted to um, grep for chromosome, if I wanted just the CPG islands from um, chromosome 1, I could grep for chromosome 1, right? But that, that could be slightly flawed. If I just do that, it's not only going to give me chromosome 1, it's going to give me chromosome 11, 12, 
13, etc., right? Because they all start with CHR1. Okay. Um, there's a trick with grep where I could do dash W, which means it's a word separated by white space. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that better? Cool. Um, so that gives me just chromosome one. Well, here's an alternate way. Is that better still? Can you see it? Maybe up a little bit higher. Just trying to. Oh yeah. Yep. Let me dim light. Oh, shoot. That family picture is cycling in the background there. Oh, well. Um, so, an alternative in awk is something that looks a little more complicated, because it is. But I'm going to walk you through what it's doing and hopefully convince you by the end of today how much more powerful using something like this is than, than grep. So the way this is working, um, awk... Um, it will talk about the origin of the name, but awk is a programming language. The way that it works is you say awk on the command line, and then what awk is expecting is a program to follow. And within these two single quotes is your program. So it expects always the program to start with a single quote, and, and in my machine, that single quote is not the one that's I don't know whether it's called a back tick or whatever. Not the one that's next to your one key. It's the uh, lowercase version of the one, the quote next to your return key. Okay. And this is saying this dollar one. This is one of the key conventions in in awk. This is referring to column one. Anytime there's a dollar sign, it's you're referring to a variable in awk. And awk has these built-in variables. It's assuming that you're giving it a, you're writing a program that is working on a file that is separated by white, where the columns are separated white by white space. And that white space is how it figures out where column one is, where column two is, where column three is, etc. So we know that the chromosome in bed format is cr column one. So that's why this, cro this program says, hey, Auk, I want you to only return data lines in this file called cpg.bed where column one, dollar one, is equal to, we have to use double equal signs. Double equal signs is asking the question, is column one equal to the value that I'm asking about? If I used one equal sign, it means set column one to the value chr1. Two equal signs means ask the question. So for essentially what's happening is this program asks awk to iterate through every line in this file and ask the question, is the first column in that file e exactly equal to chr1? If the answer is yes, it reprints the line. If the answer is no, it does not print the line. Does that make sense? Okay. So... Let's let's just run a few tests here to make sure that works. Oops. Okay, so I ran it. It gave me all chromosome one. I can change this to chromosome two. It asks the same question, but for a different thing. I can even be fancy now. I can say, I don't want it. Forget chromosome one. We hate chromosome one. Let's pr let's say only print the line if it's not. That's what the exclamation point is, if it's not chromosome one, right? And maybe I hate this chromosome. I don't know what it is. It's ugly to me. Don't want to look at it, right? So it gets rid of that one. It's giving me more ugly stuff, but it excluded that one. Okay, so this is, a, this is kind of the simplest possible awk program. I think of this as a filter. It's a sieve. It's you're trying to include or exclude things from a file. And it's nice. It's shorthand. Um, there's a more complicated way to write this where you'd say if $1 equal equal CRJR1 
curly brace, print, line, all this kind of stuff. But this, there's this really nice shorthand notation for just doing filters, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, just so just a quick aside, um, awk uh, comes from the, the first letter of the three, last name of the three people that wrote it. Uh, Brian Kernighan um, is sort of a god in computer science. He was one of the authors of the C programming language and early developer in Unix and writing all these core tools. Um, so that's where the name comes from. Um, the, the convention in the early days of, of Unix, and it's kind of persisted now, is to have people are lazy. We don't like to type things. And if you're like me, I'm a terrible typer. So having um, short command names was sort of the, the style of the day, and that remains. So they wanted it to be a nice, short, easily typable name. Right. So here's another filter that we could do. I told you that bed files, the start coordinate should always, always be less than the end coordinate because of this zero base start, one base end. So even if you're talking about one nucleotide in the genome, the interval is describing one nucleotide, the start should always be less than the end. So a, a nice way to sanity check a bed file is to test whether or not there are any lines where that is not the case. So I wrote this as, give me any lines where the end column, dollar three, the third column, is less than the second column. What's another way to write this? Do that same test. Yeah, so if, in, it, or more specifically, if two is greater than or equal to three, then that's bad news, okay? So um, I'm hoping that since we downloaded this, I downloaded this file for you from UCSC Genome Browser, that this returns no lines. Um, yep, it returns no lines. Yeah? So what if, like for example, the Windows has um, an app that has What one of those has what? The numbers have been counted, but what if it's doing like a comparison Um. You're talking about like long integer encoding kind of stuff, or just some random character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, like here's if it's a ran if you put if your third column was dog for one of these, it will try to do a comparison, but it's not the comparison that you want it to be doing. It's going to be comparing an integer with a string, and that's something that that's another whole other craziness that you you shouldn't have to deal with that. But yes, it could happen. So if it had like an Um, you know, I don't know. Let's, uh, let's try. Let's, let's just call, let's create one called Simone and CHR1 10 and 11 L. Um, it believes that three is not less than two at this point, but that's not a great test because this is 11L. So let's make it 9L. Yeah, bad things happen. It doesn't work. Okay, good question. Um, so... Um, there's, there's another, now I'm going to get into some other really fancy built-in variables in awk. Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward to do filters based upon the column number uh, when, you're, when your file is, has relatively few columns. So for instance, if I wanted to enforce um, that the last column in my file was you know, equal to some value, it's easy for me to just head the file and count how many columns there are. But if I have 1,671 columns in my file, I don't want to do that. The NR variable, um, oops, I'm confusing things. Um, forget everything I just said. NR is the line number. We'll get into column number in a second. I always confuse these. Um, so NR is, you can actually print the nth file line in the file very easily. So this is saying, is the current line number equal to 100? If so, print it. Otherwise, don't print it. Okay? 
So even though um, I think it should be sort of record number or row number, so RN, it actually, the variable is stored as NR, okay? The other thing about this is NR, you don't actually, these, these special variables, you don't actually have to use a dollar sign. To me, that's an inconsistency. I, I don't quite know why they chose to do it that way. Um, uh, perhaps it's mainly to allow you to have your own variable that you could call NR, and then you'd refer to that one with the dollar sign, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Okay, so I can get the thousandth line or the uh, ten thousandth line or the um, Oh, that should return nothing because the file isn't that big, um, et cetera. Okay. You can also say, well, I only want to look at, I know that, I think there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, because if, if you use dollar sign, it's thinking that you've established your own variable called NR, and it's testing whether that supposedly established variable NR is equal to um, 100. But since you've not set that val variable up, it's always going to return false because that that dollar NR is nothing. Yes, and that it is. There's like four or five variables like this in awk. NR. Um, the one that I always forget the name of, which we'll see in a future slide, which will remind me. And then there's like two others. The, everything else is a, used as a dollar sign. So I could also say, well, I want to look at, I think there might be a bug in my data, like something like Simone referred to in, in line, every, in some line after line 50, because some program I'm using says uh, it reports the same results for the first 50 lines and then things break. So I could just look at everything beyond the 50th line with a greater than sign, okay? I could also, if I think it's in the first 50 lines, I could scrutinize those. This is the same as what? Head-N50, right? Same thing. Well, that would be head-N49. Okay. Um, so really cool thing about awk. Now we're getting into more sophisticated programs. Everything we've done so far had one condition. We want to report lines that meet one criteria, criterion. Mul often we have multiple criteria. So in this case, anyone have a sense of what this is doing? Um, I guess it says right there in green. Um, but it is, it is looking for any line that is greater than or equal to the hundredth line and less than or equal to the two hundredth. So this is going to report lines 100 through 200, right? Um, let's just show that. Did that actually do it? Okay, let's try 1, 10, and 20 so that I can see that there's actually 11 rows. Um, yeah, okay. Right. Now we're getting really fancy. Uh, so this double and sign, as we learned in the last slide, is how you say this, this criterion and this criterion in post before you print the line off. Now we're getting fancier. It's say, well, I, you can print, print a line if it's between 100 and 200 or if it's on chromosome 22. So the output of this should be 101 lines from probably chromosome 1, because that's first in the file. So it'll be like the first batch of row lines. And then everything from chromosome 22. Why you would want to do this, I don't know. I just made this up late at night. But um, it gives you a sense of the types of things you can do to subset the data. OK, so we got a lot of chromosome 22 lines. Oof. I scrolled. And then we got the first 100 lines from chromosome 1. Okay. Um, we could even make this even fancier. We could say chromosome 22 or 
chromosome 21. Uh, and I need an extra, no, nope, that'll work. Okay. Any questions so far? We're going to get a little more sophisticated in a second. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I think, ah, yeah. That's because chromosome 21 and 22 have one extra character in the chromosome line. So this gets it sort of the, the registration of the columns. It's, um, you know, like in Excel, you could like center everything or left justify or whatever. Um, but that's a great question because now I can introduce a new command. Um, if you want, if you're fastidious like me and you want that to be like perfect, you can, um, let, me, let me just do it this way. Let me look at the first 120 lines. Okay, so that first 120 lines, we can see that breakage and it looks ugly, we hate it. Um, so what you can do is pipe that to a command called column-t for table. It'll make it like tabified or tableified. See? That keeps everything in registration. So this is a this is a useful command for doing that. Um, it can be a little bit finicky though, because if you think about what it has to do, it has to look at all the data first to see how to sort of normalize everything so it all lines up. Um, if there's a lot of lines and it has to look at a lot of inconsistency, it can take it a while to figure that out. Yeah. Um, it is inconsistent across programming languages. However, double and, double pipe, and double equal, that type of syntax is probably one of the most consistent things across programming languages. Um, I'm trying to think of another language besides awk that you could do any of this with. So Perl and Python, you can use on the command line to write little programs like this. Perl is not the same. Um, Perl has special syntax for if you're comparing strings and numbers, and Perl is, can be kind of messy. Python has the same issue, actually. Um, so to answer your question directly, no, it's not consistent across other Unix tools. Yeah. Right, right. Um, column dash T. The T is the important bit. Um, so the column command generally will, it, it's, it's, its job is to take input data and format it in various ways. The dash T is say to tell it to format it like as a table where everything's registered by column. I don't even know. The other, that's the only thing I've ever used column for. There might be, there's probably lots of other things that it can do. Um, yeah. Only to only to demonstrate one particular thing. So that's a great question. Let's go back to that one. So if I made this an and, if this was an and, think through that for a second. What would it return? I heard, I think I heard the right answer. I heard some other answers too that might have been right, but I couldn't tell. Are these, these conditions are mutually exclusive. So you're saying I want it to be line 100 through 200 and I want it to be chromosome 22. No such line exists because chromosome 22 doesn't start, I don't know, to like line 50,000 or something. So, um, but that, I mean, that's okay. I mean, if you wrote that and you got no results back, that tells you, oh, something's wrong with this. I got I got my ands and ors wrong, okay? And in these parentheses, I'm doing 
Um, this is kind of like, or, uh, I remember from solving math problems in elementary school, this is all fresh in my mind because my kids are doing this. Remember PEMDAS, parentheses, and multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, I forget what the E is. Thank you. Um, kind of the same thing here. There's an order of operations. It will evaluate things within parentheses first before it evaluates things that are between parentheses. Yeah. It would not. Print, printing, um, I don't know if I have a slide on that here. That might, we might be saving printing an awk, more formal awk uh, programs till later, but I think we'll get to that. Um, okay, so let me switch this back. So these pipes, these ors are um, the pipe symbol. Two pipes, not two ones. Okay, so, oh, yeah, here we go. Now we're talking about print. The syntax just changed all of a sudden. Before, our, every program just starts with a single quote, ends with a single quote, and has these like sieves or filters in them. Anytime you're actually using a command, the first command that we're seeing now is print. Anytime that you use a command like if or print or else, um, these are like reserved keywords in awk. These are you're getting in, once you're writing code like that, you're, you're on your way to writing actual programs like in Perl or Python. You're using logic. At that point, you have to switch to using curly braces. So your programs start and end with a quote and a open curly and a close curly and a quote when you're having a command. And this is like, you're probably like, what? And you should be like, what? because um, it's just weird. It's something you have to memorize. Why the syntax is different, don't know, um, but it is. So in this case, we're, we're doing um, something kind of special and we're introducing a new concept now. So I talked about column one being dollar one, uh, column two being dollar two, et cetera, et cetera. There's another reserved number variable and that's dollar zero. Dollar zero refers to the entire line. So this little program is actually pretty slick. It is gonna, for every line in cpg.bed, it is gonna print the entire line that's in that file, followed by, that's what this print, uh, comma sign is about, followed by dollar three minus dollar two. And what does dollar three minus dollar two um, represent? as stated on the slide, it's the length of the interval. So I find this to be, this is something I do all the time because this is a way to profile your data. So you've got, you've downloaded some annotation. Let's say you download the RefSeq GFF file and you grep for intron. You created a new file that is all the introns for every gene in the human genome. And now you're like super curious because someone asked the question in lab meeting, well, what's, what's the average size of an intron? Well, you can figure that out. You could, you could write a program like this. If you had a file that was all the introns, you could print the, the full line representing that intron followed by the length. And then you could do a couple of things. You could take that file, put it into Excel, select that new length column and, and compute the median or the mean. You could put it into R and make a histogram. You could do all these things. So this is a way, that, and, but that length information is not actually built in natively into the format. You have to compute that. Um, and so, so this, this is where awk is a, is a straightforward way to compute that. Another way to do this, if you're comfortable with R, is to load up the whole um, intron file or cpg.bed file into R and do this length computation there. There's many ways to skin this cat, but this awk is sort of a flexible way to, to muck around with your data. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Right, so um, let's, let's just do head on this. It's, it's ugly. Um, Whoever it was in the back that asked about the column command, yeah, this, this probably looks hideous to you, but um, does to me. 
So we've got, um, we're just computing the length of each of these different uh, intervals and that this new column is added at the end. You might be able to pick up something though. Look how big the space is between these columns and then look at this sad little white space. This is a problem because now our file has heterogeneous white space because what's happened is this cpg.bed file has tabs between the first four columns. That's a tab, that's a tab, but now it's a space. How do I know that? Well, I know that because I designed this, this, this example to have the problem, but I also know it because I can kind of see it. The spaces are very different. So one way to know this for sure is you can cat, you can take the output and cat-t, which, is there a question? Okay. Um, I forget what the dash t stands for. But what it does is anytime there's a tab, oh, that's what it is. It's reporting tab characters. That's what the t is for. Um, anytime there's a tab character, it puts this very intuitive caret i sign. I have no idea why it's a caret i, but it is. Um, and then what you can see is between the fourth column and this new fifth column, the length that we computed on the fly, there is no caret i, so that tells us it's not a tab. Right. Yeah. But does it still consider, is it still seen as a separate field? Yeah, so let's, so it is <laughs> yes and no. So let's, that's a great question. So here's why this is a problem, and it gets at what you're saying. If I want to now cut on that fifth column and pull out the length, it says, what are you talking about? Because cut expects that the input is tab delimited. It has no idea how to handle anything other than tab white space. Okay. However, if I do this, awk um, print dollar five, it works. Awk can tolerate a mixture of white spaces. Cut cannot. So. Um, in a nutshell, do not use mixtures of white space in your files. Always use tabs because every program you'd ever want to use, including things in, in, um, in R, good convention in R is to have your separators be tabs, um, at least in my opinion. So the way you do that, so how do we fix this problem? I think I have a slide on this. Let me... Um, yeah, well, this is, um, this is intense. Right, so this is um, getting at the many different ways that you can solve this problem. Let me, be, before I show these, let me show you the simplest absolute possible. So instead, the problem is right here. I said print the original line, then comma. When you say comma, that introduces the space. If I simply do this, the original line, then a tab symbol, which is this quote slash T quote, and then dollar three minus dollar two, it'll put a tab character between. And I can validate that by using cat dash T again and grep for um, dollar I. Oh shoot, blew it. Huh. Oh, I know why. Hold on. So now we can see that there's tab characters instead of spaces. Yeah. Why do they look kind of different? Oh, it's because the. Um, the numbers, the coordinates are so different in size. We're spanning a couple orders of magnitude in coordinates. Um, you could fix that with column dash t, though. Actually, yeah. Does that make sense? All right. So this solution, in by putting a tab character in your print statement between every column that you want to add, is nice if you have like one or two extra columns that you're printing. 
I hate typing. So if you're ty if you're writing a print statement where you're printing, let's say you have a thousand column file and you want to subset that, you want to print the seventh, the ninth, the fifteenth, and the seventeenth minus the eighteenth, as well as thirty through thirty-four. That's a lot of typing. You got to type each of those with a quote and a back tab and a quote. That you're gonna that's an opportunity for a lot of mistakes, and you're gonna be really frustrated, and you're never gonna to want to use awk again. And I want you to use awk again. So the way to do that is, um, here's what I would recommend. You use this example right here. Let me put that one in green. Where's my favorite green? There it is. This is the good one. So here's what's going on. There's this option for every awk command where you can define a variable. You can establish a variable before this program is even run. So this is the program that's going to be run on every single line in that cpg.bed. But before that program even starts, it will this will allow you to say, I'm going to set this weird special variable. You asked about um, what all the things that don't use a dollar sign. Here's another one. OFS stands for output field separator. We're going to set by default output field separator is equal to space, a single space. That's why when we did print dollar zero comma dollar three minus dollar two, it put a space there. If we override that decision and make it a tab from the get go via this, then we can still use this uh, comma, which is really nice, far less typing, but comma will become a tab character. Okay. Let's let's check me on that, and let's do yeah. Thanks. That's the way it should be pronounced. Gerp. Yep. So it worked. And now the beauty is, check this out. Now I can do um, dollar two. Dollar two, dollar two, dollar one. I'm, I'm just making stuff up here. Dollar four, dollar four. Lots of times. Oh, and I blew it. Hold on. Dollar one. And um, yeah. So now I get all that information, but I didn't have to type out those tabs. The whole thing's tab separated. Good to go. So. Um, Shoot, I think I'm running out of time here. Let me see how much I wanted to cover. I can always table to next time. I'm gonna table to next time. We'll pick up on awk. I think it's worth spending a little more time on this because um, it's so valuable. But there was something I wanted to show you and now I've forgotten it. Um, hmm? Oh yeah, I think that's gonna be next time. And that's good because I don't remember what it's called. Um, what did I want to show you? Oh, here we go. So this dash V OFS tab is so useful and so commonly needed in this type of work. Like you just, you, you just want to force yourself to use tabs. You could make it. So the question is, how could you make it? So that's always what you do, like without having to type that every time. So this is a case where we could use an alias. Have we, did we cover the aliases before? I think maybe briefly. Like for instance, if I do, um, so one of my favorite things with grep, um, is to have it report color. Well color, when, when it finds a match, it marks it in red. Actually that's an option called dash dash color, but, um, Let's just do this. Alias grep equal grep. I'm going to set grep. No, uh, this is probably going to be. Yeah. So now it doesn't do the color anymore. But now I can say alias grep equals grep dash dash color. I think it's like this or something. So every time I run grep, it automatically 
says, oh, well, you actually mean to run grep with dash dash color so you can see that it's less typing, something I don't have to remember, and just a good convention. So I can do the same thing. I can say alias awk, but you might not want to replace awk itself. You could create something like awk t for awk tabs. And you could say awk tabs is equal to awk dash um, v o f s equals tab boom. Okay, so now I could say awk t um, print dollar two dollar three on that CPG file, and it should, if I did this right, it may not have, um, it should print a tab rather than a space between column two and three. And it looks like that might have worked. Yeah, it did. So I would recommend maybe not replacing awk itself, but if you're gonna use an alias, just have it be slightly different than awk, so some awk tab you could call it, or tab awk, or t awk, or something like that, whatever you want, it's really for you. Um, but that, if you force yourself to start using that instead, then you never have to worry about this tab delimiter problem, and it really saves you a lot of time. Um, and aliases in general are, are really quite nice. This can be set up in your um, bash profile, um, which I don't know if we've talked about that yet. Did we talk about bash profile? Probably not yet. Um, but basically, you can bash profile is something that every time you log into Malibu or CHPC, it runs a series of commands like aliases to set up your environment the way you like it. And so you can customize that to your own preferences. Say again? Exactly. So the problem is this, this alias that I just made lives only for the lifetime of my session. If I log out, got to do it again. So that's where your bash profile really, we'll come, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but you can edit this, this simple text file called bash profile. You can put, put that command in it. And every time you log into Malibu, that gets run in there. So you have this nice setup. And then you can take your bash profile and wherever you go do your, your postdocs or your next position or whatever, you can take that bash profile, set it up on that new system, and you've got an environment just like you're comfortable with. OK, so next time we'll um, continue with a little bit more awk magic. And maybe I'll add a little bit more. Um, I'm going to assign a homework that is not written yet on awk just to, to get you to really appreciate the magic of this, this program. Um, and that won't be due till later in March. Probably, it might even be after March 19th. I'm still working on it, but it's coming. Um, I got a couple emails about homework five folder. I've updated the link in that slide. It's now, um, that link will allow you to write your homework to it. A reminder that that's not due till Tuesday because I had so many mess ups with that. You can have a little more time dealing with it. Um, and I will work on writing homework six and, and share that when it's done. Okay. All right. See you next week.